studies are going to the book of Acts. Our lesson today comes from the verse, the verses 8 through 20. And we find Paul Barnabas in the middle of their missionary journey. We know that they traveled to Syria and Antioch and to the island of Cyprus. They sailed to the southern shore of the modern day Asia Minor. They continued north. They passed to Antioch. And they turned east and went to Iconium. And then our lesson today is where they flee. They flee at south to Lystra from Iconium. And a uh, few important, few important uh, notes we need to take. Now, this Lystra is still in the Iconium region. It's the province of Galatia. <coughs> It became a Roman colony around 25 BC as a military outpost for Rome against pirates and thieves and from the Tarsian Mountains in the south. Uh, it's a small town. And apparently, it has not even enough Jewish host to host a synagogue. Mm -hmm. So we're standing, we need to put our mindset where we're at. We're in a place, mm -hmm. Paul and Barnabas find themselves in a place that they're in a pagan nation or a Gentile nation. Now I understand these folks have never been taught, didn't know the God of Israel. Nope. They didn't know anything about the true living God. Mm -hmm. They was raised up and they were raised in a pagan or Gentile world. And they, they had no idea. So we find when Paul and Barnabas gets there, as usual, Paul would always go and preach at the synagogue first. Well, there was no synagogue. We find Paul preaching in the street. And he don't preach. We find he don't preach. He don't start. Go through the Old Testament. Like all the people of Israel knew the history of Moses and all the ones. He preaches to them he, that there is a true living God and all their gods are in vain. But let's start. And he, <laughs> verse 8 said, And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. So Luke has given us, he's telling us exactly who this person is. He didn't become crippled by some disease or some accident. Or something didn't happen to him because suddenly he couldn't walk anymore. Luke tells us exactly that he's never walked. When he was born, he was born crippled. He never took a step. He never stood on his feet. He, he never walked from the day he was born. And we know Luke is calling a man in Jewish terms. You're not a man until you're 30 years old, so we can presume reasonably that he was over 30 so over a 30 years old man had never walked so we're leading up to how spectacular that we know only God it wasn't just a coincidence that this man started walking again he had never walked so we find that it had to be God and verse 9 says, And the same heard Paul speak, the same man heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beheld him, and perceiving him that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Paul said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and he walked. And the people saw, saw that Paul what Paul had done. They lifted up their voices, saying, In the Laconia <coughs> tongue, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. <laughs> so this is kind of familiar as we've been through the book of Acts. In verse chapter 3, we remember that when Paul and John walked, come by the gate of beautiful and the lame man laid there and Peter steadfastly looked on him, told him silver and Gold have I none, but such as I have, I give to thee. And he healed. He reached and got the lame man. We find that we find later that 
Peter said, why are you looking at us? Why are you staring at us like we had something to do with this? This same Jesus that you crucified hung on a tree in his name and in his power is the one that healed it. We have nothing to do with it. Or we can go to the contrary. We studied not too long ago in chapter 12 how Herod dressed himself and ordained, ordained, or ordained himself in fine linen, gold, and silver, and stood in the morning sun, and the people proclaimed how he had the voice of a god. In Tyre, and Harold didn't, Harold, King Herod didn't dispute them or rebuke them. He accepted the glory of God. And God struck him dead. So Paul, here's Paul and Barnabas. Paul has just told a man to stand up, and now all these people are thanking their gods. My, my. And the verse 12 said, And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Now, let's get, I want to stop right here for just a second. I want you to know the mindset of those, these people. I want you to know what they're thinking. They call Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercury. These are the Roman names for the Greek gods, Zeus and Hermes. They believed in their culture. They were taught and they had this thought. And there was a legend that was taught that these two Greek gods came down to earth, posed as men one day, and nobody gave them hospitality except two old peasant people, mm -hmm. Philemon and Paulus, his wife. And supposedly that they was the only two that entreated these Greek gods. And so then the whole community Wiped out. Yep. Only that leaving the only two, Philemon and his wife, that give them hospitality. So the whole community was wiped out. Nobody living but them. And they was left with all everything in the town, but and they was left in guard of this beautiful, splendid temple. And that's where they lived, and that's where they took care of until upon their death. And upon their death, they came back as trees on each side of the gate to continually walk the guard and take through the gate. So that's what these people had been taught. That's what they had learned. And that's what they was thinking. They called Barnabas Jupiter because I guess Barnabas was more older and more Taught bigger, and so they called him Zeus, the chief of gods, and they called Paul Mercury, which is Hermes, which is because he did all the speaking, was the voice of the spokesman of the gods. So verse 13 says, Then the priest Jupiter, which was before the city, brought oxen and garland into the gates and it would have done a sacrifice to the people. So this priest of their Greek god, Jupiter, to him it's showtime. <laughs> this has happened. It's showtime. It's my time to shine. I'm going to go get the ox. I'm going to go get all the decorations. I'm going to get It's time for us to give honor and promote our God. Evidently, there was a language barrier because Paul and Barnabas really didn't know what was happening until they seen all the oxen in the garden and things coming up. I think it's funny we can look back and we think what, how silly people was to worship idols. <clears throat> in fact, if we can find in Isaiah, I think it's 44, 45, somewhere there, Isaiah, just paraphrasing, Isaiah makes kind of a fun of mock of idol worship. He said a man will take a stick, mm -hmm. 
He'll take one end of it and roast his food. He'll take the other end of it and cut it off and build a fire and warm himself. And he'll take the middle of it and he'll carve it out, him a God, and he'll bow down and worship it. Which kind of sounds kind of funny, don't it? Feel it. But think about it, folks. Anything that you or I put before God can come to become an idol to us. Don't matter what it is. No, we may not actually bow down and pray to it and worship it per se, but if we put it before God, Amen. it's an idol to us. So let's take the same logic. A man will take earn money. And there's nothing wrong with that. God said that he would wish that we'd all prosper and do good. But some men of mankind, not just man, but mankind will take money. He'll take that, earn that money, Andy. He'll take that same money, he'll buy him something to eat. He'll take that same money, he'll buy him a home and a place to stay warm. He'll take that same money, he'll put it in the bank. And as it grows, he starts to begin to put all his trust. That's where his dependence mm -hmm. is. All his dependence, all his trust, all his hope becomes that. So we have to be careful. We have to be careful that we don't allow things to become our idols. You know, and one other thing before we go on is we find... A lot, a lot of places in the book of Acts and in the Bible there is only one Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He's Lord of Lords. He's God. King of Kings. He and only He deserves all honor, all glory. It all belongs to Him. We're nothing. He is everybody. we got to be careful that we don't start worshiping the messenger. Come on. It's not about the messenger. The message. It's the message. And I won't mention names, but you can, these great big churches, television evangelists, there's lots of folks they go there, and it's not about the message. It's about the messenger. It's nothing, never, ever, ever about the messenger. It's the message of Jesus Christ. It's the message of the gospel, the good news of the gospel that can free you, make you whole this morning. Only Jesus can do that. So when Paul and Barnabas figures out what's going on, verse 15 says, and they say, Sir, why do you do these things? We are also men of like passion with you, and we preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heavens and earth and sea, and all the things therein. So why are you doing this? We're here to tell you about the true and living God. Your gods are vanity. There's not but one true and living God. And that's why our message is here today. That's why we're here. We're trying to tell you about this God of Israel. This God of the world. The true living. Only true living. He said, in, Who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left him, left not himself without witness, in that he did good, he gave rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. So what's Paul saying there? Paul's saying, we're here to tell you about this God of Israel, the true living God. Now, yes, he was the God of Israel, but he's the God of the world. God allowed you to walk in your own ways. 
He allowed, he suffered, he, he allowed it. All nations to walk in their own ways. But he said, now, nevertheless, he didn't leave you without a witness. He created the heaven, the stars, everything around you, the trees, the rivers, the oceans, you name it. This God I'm talking about is the one who created it. He gave it to you as a witness. And because of him, you have your being. You know, I've said, I've testified this many a time. For the longest time, the longest time before I became, before I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ, James, I did, and I'm not bragging. I worked hard. I did what I had to do, worked long hours. I did everything I thought by these two angels in this mind. I thought everything that I owned, everything that I possessed, everything that I had came by my hard work, my By myself. Till I understood, I, it wasn't until I gave my heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior that I understood that all through my days, even though I wasn't a Christian, even though that I didn't serve the Lord, the Lord was still merciful unto me. He gave me the help, He gave me the strength. He gave me the mind. He put clothes on my back. He put food on my table. He took care of me and my family. I wasn't a Christian. I didn't serve him. I never thought nothing about it. But he was still mindful of me. Because he said he's long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but all will come to read. Paul said, nevertheless, in him without, he didn't leave himself, not himself without a witness. He did good and gave us, and he gave us all the rain, the fruit. He gave us Tony everything we needed. Even though we didn't serve him, he wasn't impartial to us, he still sustained us and took care of us, hoping one day we'd come to him. Then in verse 18, and, and with these sayings, scarce restrain the people that they have done, that they had not done the sacrifice unto them. So with all that Paul said, scarcely they, they give it up, they didn't do it. They still wanted to. Scarcely they didn't. He barely talked them out of it. And then came thither certain Jews from Antioch, Iconium, who persuaded people had persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city and supposedly he was dead. Albeit the disciples stood around him about him, and he rose up and he came to the city the next day and departed with Barnabas to Derby. So the previous chapters, we find that they was going to stone Paul, and they fled. Today, we find that they did. You know, good things happen, or bad things happen to good people. If I was standing there to tell you, if I was standing there this morning trying to explain to you why, I'd be foolish because I don't know. Bad things do happen to good people. But God promised us he'd never leave us and never forsake us. Now we find Luke's writing, we don't know 
if Paul was dead or not. They presumed he was, and maybe he was. But the people stood around about him. They drug him outside the city chains and threw him down as dead. And the people, disciples and the people, stood about him. They didn't leave him. No doubt, I don't know, I would assume they stood over him and prayed and prayed and prayed. Some of them mourned, some of them prayed. But they didn't give up. And he said, he arose up and he came into the city and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Many of those stood around him may have just come to the faith. They may have been just, just got saved. He stood around Paul as he laid there and they prayed and they didn't give up. Paul, what did Paul do? Paul stood up. Battered, bruised, Bleeding, no doubt. He brushed himself off. And he went on the journey with Barnabas. Went on the journey preaching the gospel. Of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, Paul writes in his writings in a depressing way. He said he pressed through the mark of the high calling. I don't know what tomorrow holds. Nobody in this building does. Nobody listens to me. Does. Don't know what tomorrow holds. But I know who holds tomorrow. Amen. And I know who I put my faith and trust in. Amen. And I know who I depend on this morning. Amen. And that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're here this morning, you're saved. I don't know what you may have to go through, and you don't know what you may have to go through. Just because we're saved, we're not living in a bubble. We're not living under an umbrella. We're living in this world. Amen. But Jesus Christ said, be of good cheer, I've overcome it. If you're in this building this morning, if you're listening to me, and you think, well, I don't need the Lord. I'm doing all right. I don't need him. I've got a good job. I've got to get home. I'm making it just fine on my own. No. God's being merciful to you. Amen. Nevertheless, God let you walk in your own way. He gave you your own free will. He's not going to force you to serve him. God made himself known unto you by the creation and through his spirit and through all things. Nevertheless, God's still taking care of you. But there's coming a day that you're going to have to make a choice. There's coming a day you don't know what tomorrow holds. But you may wait it one day too late. Yeah, you're making it all right, but nevertheless, God is the one that you allow you to do it, taking care of you, hoping that you'll come to him one day. Bless you.